G'day and welcome to the Blind Advocate channel. If you like what you've seen, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell and hit that like button as well. Alright, so we're here um, with a very good friend of mine, Steve Austin. Um, Steve's been in a wheelchair for a very long time. Can you just ex um, tell us how you ended up being paralysed in the waist down? Uh, yes, Jeff, I can tell you that. In, on the 8th of January, um, 1975, I was fishing with a couple of mates down near near Kempsey, a place called Taruka, and we were sitting there and fishing and getting some good bites and everything. And then I had a bad pain in my back um, and felt as though somebody had stabbed me. I just stayed there for an hour and a half and finally tried to get back up to where the other blokes were. Um, they were getting ready to cook something for tea and everything. I walked, it took me an hour and a half to get up to where they were, and which was about 20 metres, and then I just collapsed again. What it was, they um, took me to hospital, Kempsey, did a lumbar puncture and found out that there was an obstruction in my spine and they organised for the air ambulance to take me down to Sydney Hospital for a where they put a dye into tip the a bed that they had me on upside down so that my head was facing the the floor and put the dye into it and found an obstruction on T five six and then they operated, took a biopsy and found out there was an appendinoma and it got into the spine and burst and damaged uh, quite a few nerves that um, you know, resulted in me not being able to, to walk anymore. Okay. So do you had no warnings, it just happened all of a sudden? There was no symptoms or...? Well, I did have a symptom about a month before when I was working out at the university. I was a carpenter and working on a scaffold in a lecture theatre and it was pretty... Um, pretty high up and I just had a bad pain and uh, and I said to the fellow I was working with at the time that if it hadn't gone, you know, if it didn't stop by the time I finished work that day, I'd have to go to the hospital or somewhere and, and see what it was. But it, it went away and that was it, never got any more um, pain until that day on the, in January down at Bellbrook. So when you first got in the hospital and they um, you know, found there was an obstruction there, what was going through your mind? I didn't know what it was because that was at um, about 12 o'clock in the morning when they um, got me down there and put me on the, put me on the table to do the, um, to do the test and find out what it was. I just didn't have an, any idea at all what it was and what the, saying they um they waited for 10 days after they did the took a biopsy and everything and, and removed the disc in the that disc that was rotten there they removed that and everything and um waited until my um well it was my birthday 22nd birthday 10 days later and they gave me a, a beer and a bit of cake and then they told me I'm going in. I was going in the next morning for a fairly long operation to see what what could be done about the uh, the growth and how much damage it had done to the spine. So, did they tell you at that time or after the after the operation that they told you that you wouldn't walk again? Never told me. the The um, specialist, the professor, uh, or Mister Rushworth did not believe that I didn't have any, you know, that I didn't have any um, problems with it, bef with my back before, and everything he told my parents, but he never really told me that I wasn't going to be able to walk again. I just got news about it, you know, in, in a roundabout way from my family and from my um, sister, who 
only just graduated that a couple of weeks after I ended up in um, in hospital down in Sydney. So being treated like that, not being kept informed, how did, how did that make you feel? What was going through your mind? Well, I was very disappointed that they wouldn't. He wouldn't tell me. He he didn't talk to the patients. He got one of his um, interns to come and tell me what was going on and um, with op- you know, with operations, further operations and everything. He he was not one of the. He wasn't a people person. He he sent the underlings to uh, to explain, tell me what was going on. But looking from yeah you know, back from this point back to when that first happened, um, you know, how did that make you know, how does it make you feel now to the way you were treated back then? Well are you, are you angry or Well I would I was angry with the fact that he didn't come and talk to me face to face. He'd just get the others to do it. You know, he didn't believe any you know, the times he come in to see me, he just said I don't believe that you didn't have warning or anything about the, um, you know, what the pain was and you didn't go and, you know, or didn't go and get tested or anything. But even, I went to the best place possible. I've gone to Sydney and I had to wait for four weeks before I could get a bed at North Shore, which is the spinal unit, and they gave me a bit more notice and you know, ideas and everything then because so, it took a long time. Well, just going back to before you went to Royal North Shore, um, how were your family keeping, especially your mum and dad? They come up to, to visit me on all, they alternated the weekends and I have a, very lucky and I have a, uh, well I had a sister just younger than me that had come and visit me every day all by one day that um, that I was in hospital, just one day she couldn't make it, so it was very good at supporting there. But what what was the actual impact on on your whole family, but mainly your parents? Well, it was a big impact on all the family, yeah, because they didn't didn't know what to expect. They didn't know how I, yeah, how I'd cope with it and everything. Um, it was one good thing that came across with. Yeah, you know, mum and dad, they um, they weren't talking before prior to me collapsing. They had an argument over the way that dad sort of kicked me out of house um, because I wouldn't go I wouldn't go home when I was you know, I was drunk and and he didn't um, didn't like the idea of his son being out. You know, drunk and everything and people knowing about it and um, when I collapsed they got together and um, well they were both living living in the same house but they ended up being a family again which was good mm. as far as that goes but they were still it was still hard for them and they did um, make plans and got a a an accessible bed a bathroom and everything for me and got all that done and um, the community helped with that. We had cousins that were builders and they helped all that, did that at the right price for me so I could get into the get into the house because there were, all there were is at the back of the house was steps and everything. So they got a ramp and, and put a new veranda out there so I could get into it, it was good. So you got... You're in the hospital for four weeks and you went over to Royal North. Sure, yeah. Which is fine that you're over there. Mm. Um, what was that like? That must have been a huge impact on, on you personally. It was because I, um, for the first four weeks, while they had the, the operations and everything on me, I could not move. I wasn't allowed to, to sit up even because of the stitches and the... Yeah, the the scar that was a fairly big, um, long yeah um, hole in the back of it, Oops. and because of the um, with all the stitches and everything in there, they had to open it up and yeah you know, clear it, make sure everything was clear, and I just could not um, do anything there. I just 
it was be either laying on my back or laying on the side to eat and drink and everything. I'd get bird baths and, and all this stuff. Or I'd never had that, you know, in my life before. I was able to do a lot of stuff. But it was a big impact. But when I got to the um, North Shore, where the spinal unit was, in the old cottages, there were a lot of people there that, um, you know, other paras and that that had had experience with it and they knew, you know, they were talking me through it and, you know, what to expect and way I could do things and, and everything. But the the um, nurses and sisters were really great down there. You know, they uh, were, were very reluctant to go to the spinal unit initially because that's when they, they learnt, you know, hands-on experience rather than going to the university like they do now. They weren't real sure about us because thought we'd be angry because a lot of them, you know, the, the nurses were the same age as us and they just didn't know what to expect. But you know, we helped the nurse and staff and, and the other paras and quads helped us, helped the new um, paras and that, so it was always good to talk to them and, and let me know what to expect and how to do it. and you know, and they tried to get me to stay in Sydney. A fellow from Mount Wilga, who was a rehab, um, well, he was in charge of the rehab centre uh, where you get retrained for jobs. He said you'd never get a job in Armadale because out in the country they don't have the cap yeah, they don't have enough experience or j jobs for somebody in a wheelchair. And I asked him, I, I asked him, um, you know, have you ever been to Armadale? And he said, no, but all country towns are the same. He had the attitude or I had to stay in Sydney. So when you were in Royal North, did, um, what was your day out? So what happens when you first wake up? What was your routine? But in there, well, you'd have to you know, get showered and all this sort of stuff. I could... I'd get a, a shower chair and go in and shower myself and everything. It took me at least six weeks before I could shower myself. Yeah. So when I say about the so you get up in the morning, you yeah. go and have a shower and brush your teeth. Yeah, um, have, well, I have, after I have breakfast and they'd bring that in and you know, and um, do it. And we were in different areas. Is in that there was a room for the newly injured um, people to go there and they were getting us ready for becoming independent and then getting ready to go home. There's three different stages there. So, so you know, you, you come out of the shower, what would you do after you have a shower? Would well, you, you go to physio? Or? I'll get dressed and then go to physio or some, um, some of the rehab stuff in there, so, you know, doing exercises and that through there to to um, you know, to train and knowing how to transfer and and doing you know just being able to cope by myself um, for when I get ready you know when I go home. So what would you do at physio? So would you do exercises? Or? Yeah, well they do exercise, but they couldn't do too much for a while because my back was fairly sore. Yeah. You know, yeah. Times I'd get it, you'd get that, and they'd, they'd have to give me painkillers and that for a while, and just tried different you know, exercises that were good for me, and ones that didn't help, and to try and um, get a bit of strength in my legs and everything. I could stand up for a while and um, use the monkey bars and everything, and walk along there a little bit but then yeah try to stand up but it was just too hard they uh, realized that i wouldn't be able to do any walking without uh, you know without some support and stuff and i just sit down and just in the chair and and then teach me a few skills in the chair so to, to um, jump gutters and you know, go down steps and all these ways of pushing, you know, getting around safely. So, um, when you're doing physio, you learn how to 
to, to do new things. Um, what was going through your mind? I, I just wanted to tap into into that to let people know um, some of the the issues that you had to face. Well, not being able to walk again. Um, you know, I thought, you know, if I kept on going, I might be able to do it. But um, you know, just after a certain time, there's, you know, just had to realise that there was no way I'd be able to. Um, get around on my feet again. I just have to had to learn to get used to a chair, and it was uh, yeah, it was a while. But I got over it after mean, a while. What do you mean by getting over it? Well, yeah, I had to accept it. But at least I, I've been realistic in the fact that if I uh, had to go to the loo, I know nobody would take my chair because it was always I was. Sitting in it was my mobility, mm. yeah, and um, I'd get around in it. But you can do as many as it helped me with some of the other paras and that there that have been in a chair for a while. That you know, it's not the end of the world. You can still do a lot of things. And they told me about some of the options for sport and activities it could do. So, what what do you think was the hardest thing besides accepting? Um, the paralysis, what was the hardest thing that you had to accept and, and you know, work your way through? Well, it was funny because my first wife at the time, she came to me, visited me once and said she cleaned up the house, the flat where I was living and, um, and she was more worried about whether at, um, our son, who was two year old at the time was um, you know, whether the the tumour was hereditary or anything like that and I said no it's not hereditary it's just one of these things and um, and she said oh well that's good and then left and never heard from her again until after I came home that uh, was a bit hard yeah um, I, I want to get into that just a little bit later mm. so how long were you in Royal North Shore for? How? Oh, probably. Um, I was at North Shore for at least six months, getting everything ready. Oh. And I, I didn't um, didn't get back home because I didn't have anywhere, yeah, uh, where I could go into the bathroom, you know, I had an accessible bathroom or anything there for a while and um, I had to get some of that done before I could go back, you know, come back to Armadale. So when you say you had to get everything ready, are, are, um, you want to explain that? To, are you talking about um, the correct way to use the wheelchair going up and down? Yeah, the use, and... yeah. It was uh, doing that and um, have to do my own personal care stuff and and everything and getting the right supplies and you know, for the equipment for it and getting a a chair myself well getting a chair that's suitable um, there weren't many options for chairs back in 75 I got a chair they said it was one of the best things in a, um, a good stable chair and everything but it, even then it weighed 25 kilos didn't matter too much but it was not well designed um when i'm jumping gutters or when i was jump down the gutters or get back up onto it it put a lot of pressure on the um, axles of the chairs after about six months the axle would break and the and the push whirl would fall off and i'd end up on the on the road <laughs> that happened quite often so, you know, when you learn to use a wheelchair, um, you know, the hardest thing um, um, would be to know your limits. Yes, to know your limits and, um, you know, that's, well, of course, being a reasonably small town here, people, um, the council and, and a lot of the businesses weren't um, wheelchair friendly, so I always had to rely on you know, my um, 
brother and sister, sisters and that to try and help you know, get things for me at times. I couldn't go in and get some clothes, you know, to try them out. And I couldn't get into the change rooms there. So we had um, one of the businesses, the jewelry's um, store, that um, their family lived across the road from us and they'd bring clothes home for me to try at home, which was awkward. I'd rather, I wanted to be independent because here I was, uh, 22, and, you know, wanted to be able to do, look after myself and get everything for myself, but they were quite good. So when you first came back home, because you, know, you live in Armidale in New South Wales, mm-hmm. um, what was it like coming back into your circle of friends? Did people, some people were accepting, other people were not accepting? Uh, well, it was funny because a couple of days after I came home, um, on I've been in the building trade. A lot of my uh, friends um, used to go down to the club hotel on a th- Thursday night, because it was pay night, and have a few drinks and everything. And one of the um, one of them, he was a cousin of mine, uh, you know, just planned it with mum and dad to uh, take me out for a while, and they took me to the pub, and they weren't sure. You know, in the chair and everything, and they all shouted me drinks, and I got a little bit, yeah, a little bit merry and everything there, and it, you couldn't get into the toilet in the in the hotel or anything like that. But they they helped me, you know, get around and and stuff. Uh, they were a bit uncertain as to how I would feel because here I was sitting in the chair, and they weren't, and they'd have to look down at me. Yeah, when they're talking to me, I just said, yeah, just sit down and you, you're right. And, um, yeah, they, some of them were a bit unsure. They just didn't know what to think. The only thing I was angry about was the two fellas that I was with um, down when I was fishing. I, I asked them, you know, to keep some for me, but they ate all the bloody fish <laughs> that I'd caught and were looking forward to a nice feed of, um, you know, fish but they they ate them all so when you got back home um what was it like i mean we spoke about your family what about the rest of the community not strangers would they give you a wide berth or would they just some of them did yes some of them did but the um other people weren't quite sure how to approach me yeah again because they thought i was ang- i'd be angry because i was in the chair and they aren't, you know, and they, they just weren't quite sure how to approach it. And I even had um, people adamant that I dived into the river where I was fishing and hit a submerged rock or submerged tree. And they were arguing me with me about it. And I said, I know what happened exactly. And they said, you know, oh, no, you know. Or they, others said that I had a car accident. And I said, no, I just was fishing, had a bad pain, and bang, I just couldn't walk again. And they just doing all of that stuff. That was, that was a bit hard to, um, you know, to get into their heads. So I just ended up letting them go. You know, it's just, I'll stick to my story. I know more about it because I was there, and they weren't. You know, and it was. It was a bit awkward, you know, and, and some people understandably don't know how you can, how people can cope with it. It's just, yeah, you, know, you either accept it or don't accept it. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a little bit before about your first wife, mm-hmm. um, and, and that she left you. You'd never seen her after that. Mm-hmm. Um, having to deal with losing. Your independence and mobility and becoming uh, paralysed waist down. Having all that to deal with, then you have to turn around and deal with that. So, how hard was that for you? It was really, really hard because she was, um, at, by the time I got back, she was, um, well, in a relationship with another man that had that worked up at Glen Innes, one of the um, service stations up there, and she was there. 
and um, with with Steve and um, my son and um, you know I tried to maintain a relationship with him. Well, you know, she was she was old. He was a lot older than her. He was old enough to be a father and um, you know, got into that and I tried to go up once I got a car on the road and um, to help the dad and everything he he got it he got one little car going for me and got the hand controls and everything done so I could drive but I'd go up there I'd make a, a an appointment to see him and go all the way up to Glen Innes to find out where he was oh he's gone somewhere else for the for the day or for the weekend, despite making um, yeah making a, a booking as such to get into it, and that what yeah that's what um, drove me yeah to distraction. I was well, I reckon it was um, yeah I had a right to be angry about that because she just wouldn't yeah she made seemed to make a chore that make sure that I didn't get to see him and he he very rarely even calls me dad I couldn't even send a birthday card from saying the card was from dad me you know and I said the reason why I haven't been in his life is been taken away you know it was an hour's drive and like I said he'd go up there and make sure I did the right thing and um, I wouldn't go into the service station because I would, I'd wait outside for him and um, yeah, talk to him there and play a few games with him while I could and everything. But then when he didn't come out these times when I went up, I'd have to go in just to see what was going on, where he was, why he wasn't coming out. And then to be found that, um, yeah, that he was gone, that somebody he'd gone somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and that was... That was very frustrating. So, what was your first job? Because you said you were a carpenter before. So, what what was your first job after you came back? Well, when I was told I'd never get a job in Armidale because of the you know, yeah. country towns are the same, I rang my you know, dad up and everything, and that, and, and I just said I asked him to look around and see if there was any place I could get in where I could, you know, learn to do something and they had the um he did i could have done some um small you know like drills and saws and portable saws and everything like that that i could repair because i did some of that in the building trade when they weren't working and i had a job that i could have done that for the um, new england county council as it was or there was a workshop there sheltered workshop where people could um, build things and I could help them do that with my building background. Yeah. I did stuff like um, saw stools and dog kennels and we did um, or tables, barbecue tables and picnic tables in the council thing and swings and did a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. And I was teaching people with um, intellectual disabilities how to do some of them. And he, with my expertise, I was, for that I was paid a, a princely sum of ten dollars a week, two dollars a day that I worked there above the pension. But so, um, so, all right, so we'll, we'll just jump up ahead to um, when you were working. Um, it used to be Challenge. Now it's the Ascent Group, I think. Yeah. Well, it was it was Rusden Enterprises. That's where I was working. Okay. And that was in uh, Rusden Street. Then we moved to the. Uh, we were building things outside because it was an old house where we had the stuff and it wasn't big enough. So we developed other um, timber products and everything. And we went down to a big building, the old gasworks building, where we made a lot of. Um, bulk bins for um, fruit and everything and sending them up to uh, Applethorpe and around there in Queensland and 
apple cases and all that sort of stuff. We did that. We did um, a lot of furniture, outdoor furniture, and we also did tubs for um, pot plants and everything. We did that and sent them all over the place. And at that time, I was getting, I was the manager of that area and doing all of the uh, organising all that and making sure that the um, all the products were shipped away, you know, trucked away everywhere in time, and it was you know, very big. It was a big business then. But so, that, when did you start working for council, getting people with disabilities into? That was a, yeah. That was I. I ended up leaving Rusden because they had too many top-heavy people on Black Friday, the 13th of May, 1983. They stopped, they just closed that there for people with physical disabilities. They only wanted intellectual disabilities there. And I went into council um, after being employed as a recreation access, um, recreation access project to get people with disabilities into um, non-work activities and you know, of their choice. And I went from being sponsored by Challenge or Brisbane Enterprises to uh, to go to the council under their auspice, and um, that was about 1985, I think I got that job, and um, doing that. And because I was only funded a certain amount through the government, council put me on as an access advisor and they put and paid the extra wages so I was working full time and looking at um, local, well it was public buildings, access into the public buildings and understanding the, um, the standards, disability standards for the requirements for a, a suitable access into businesses and um, doing that and I was advised, I was an advisor for a lot of the architects and everything and negotiating with them and, about what was required because some of them were using the old standard, disability standards in it and just making sure that the buildings they had and the applications they put into council they, that they had to comply to the current standards. And yeah, so um, you and I were friends um, back in the you know, um, mid 80s through darts, like competition darts. Mm -hmm. um, and when I got sick in 89 and came back, I think it was January 1990, you were the first and the only person that rang up and to see if I was alright and if I needed anything. Was that part, I know you don't because we're friends, but did you do also do that for other people when they first came back? I tried to, yes, that's what I was, um, because of the fact that I, well, I came back knowing what nothing about what was in, available in Armidale. When they discharged me from Sydney, they didn't give me any feedback as to what was here. Mm. And I didn't want anybody else to you know, suffer the same sort of experience. You know, I didn't even know. I went and put in for a mobility allowance um, at the Social Security, which gave a little bit of money to put towards fuel costs, going for, you know, for me to go to work and looking for work and everything, a little bit of money in that. But when I rang the local people up here, I went into the... Social Security, they knew nothing about it, didn't even know what it was mm. and um, you know, did all that so I did it uh, for people I didn't know and and you, you know, when I, was, when I was on my feet and everything, it's just one of those things. I'd like to make sure that people knew what was available and where to look for that, um, you know, it was that I had to struggle and I'm pretty sure that nobody um, you know, was made aware of it before they 
once you're out of the doors of the hospital in Sydney, they seem to forget about you. And so it was as a friend and as a just knowing what was about what hassles I had here to try and get it. Yeah, yeah, because it um, basically you and, and um, Peter Bannon sort of opened up the doors in this area for people with disabilities. Um, and I know how hard you worked over the years to try and make that transition mm. from hospital back to home, back to Amara, back to the community mm. uh, as easy as possible by giving that information. So I just wanted to quickly jump ahead to um, the last few years. Now, all those, how long um, were you using a push chair for? I was using a push chair from 1975 and, sorry, I forgot the... Oh yeah. yeah, I was I was pushing around from seventy five until nineteen you know, well thirteen years ago when I um I had problems I tore my biceps from pushing around too much. So around about two thousand and ten is when you first so yeah. what are your arms because I just want people to know all those years of, of using your arms as legs. What's it done to you, to, to your joints, your shoulders, your elbows, your wrists, your hands? Yeah, well I've got problems with the, I've got no biceps on either arm and I've got, um, they'll call, they'll call, it's a condition, scapholunate disassociation. Mm -hmm. It's oh, that's right. Yeah, having itself. And we'll keep going with the um, normal count. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I've got in my um, wrist. It's called scapholunate disassociation. Means the tendons are coming apart, and uh, it's quite painful to push around. And I wear, being a dominant left hand, I've got a glove. Which means it, which restricts my movement on my left hand, and I'm not able to um, get a decent grip on a um, in the manual chair, and not strong enough to push around anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I've been in a power chair now since non in um, for 13 years. I have a van that's um, paid a lot of money to get it modified so it can be driven with hand controls and I take my chair into the, through the back of the, the car and put it into, it locks into a dock and they'll transfer onto the driver's seat and it's on the track and take it to the, to the steering column and use uh, hand controls to get around. Yeah, so I just want people to understand, Steve's got a, uh, what they call people metal family minibus sort of thing. Um, all the seats have been taken out of that. Um, the back uh, now has you press a button and the back opens up um, and lower, lowers down for a ramp so it's steep and well straight in and it just transfers. So that, that, that how, uh, how much did that cost to purchase the vehicle and, and then to have it converted so it's accessible and ready for you to use? Well, I bought the vehicle in 1980, in, um, it was an 80, no, 2009 model. I got it registered, $40,000 to purchase the vehicle, and the modifications, I had to go, once I got it registered, sent it back down to Sydney to a place called Freedom Motors, who rip out, it was an eight-seater. They take the two rows of three seats and take them to the tip, and they modify the um, the car, and it cost nearly fifty thousand dollars to to modify. Um, at that stage, the government didn't help with anything like that. They cut a hole in the um, in the floor and put a, a false floor in it, about three hundred mil down, and they have to replace the fuel tank and the exhaust system, make it a flat tank so that it doesn't belly out onto the road or anything like that and cause leaks and um, it's just a lot of money 
and I can now drive, still drive around. Um, and the, the chair that, I've, that I'm sitting in locks onto a, a docking system on the floor of the car so that the chair won't move and it's, it's locked in and it won't move until I have to press a button to, to unlock it and let it come out once I'm in the chair, return into the chair. So, if you had to give one bit of advice for someone who's going to be transitioning from the hospital to home and back into the community, what would that advice be? Well, just if you've got family here um, or somewhere, you know, wherever you're moving to, just make sure that you are yeah, you know what it's what's available, what is here, where where the shortfalls are, and um, yeah, get the people in the the social workers and the the experts in whichever hospital you go to in Sydney you are in, admitted to, get them to find out what's available or your family. If you're coming home to family, just find out what is there, and there are people with experience in having a spinal cord injury that can can help both the person and the family members to to know what it's like you know what to expect when when you get back home because in the hospital they do look after you but once you're home you are basically isolated you you need to be sure of what's about you know what you need to do what you know the um, the sources that you might need to get to, and you know, just making sure it's around, and and who can modify your car, your house, to make you know, to provide wheelchair access, and all that sort of stuff. You just need to get all that done. So you, you really need to find out what is accessible, what's not accessible. Yes. As well as you know, uh, rely on family and friends to help. Yes. When you can't do something else. Yes, you do need to look into it. It requires a lot, and a lot of people don't know about it. Even the able bodied people don't know what somebody in a wheelchair needs. So if you know of somebody that's where, you, where you live that is in the wheelchair, see if the family can contact them and, um, you yeah. know. And talk to your parents about it too, or your, or your husband or wife, and the kids and everything. Yeah. If you do come home, it could be a little bit angry some people, and it takes a bit of adjustment. And the ones that you love, you might be a bit angry with them. You're a bit angry, you take your anger out on them. So you've just got to let them know that you, you know, you, um, we do change a little bit once you get a, a disability. Um, as far as you know, your patience, you lose your patience and that, and that a little bit and your temper with them, but you try not to take it out on them because they're the ones you need for a while once you're getting home and adjusting. It's very important. And um, yeah, but you, you do need independence, but you do need to have the support from your family and your children, you know, your parents and everything there and your friends in the community. And it can happen. In my case, I tell people, I didn't have an accident, but you know, we all have a potential of ending up in a chair or something through no fault of our own or through some silly things we do. Yeah, you know, some people have. All right, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit... No, yeah. Yeah. That's it. no thanks, appreciate your time. It's, it's alright. Well, I was telling one fellow in... Um, he was 18. He celebrated his 18th birthday and having his... his um, yeah, independence, got his, got his HSC and he's all ready to face the world again. Oh, he's, you know, to get out and go looking for a job. But he went on a cruise, his parents shouted him on a cruise with all his schoolmates, and he um, had a he had a lot of alcohol to drink, 
and his mates dared him that they'd pay five dollars if he'd strip off and dive into the pool on the ship. He did that and um, went too deep, broke his neck, and he could not stay in a chair for any more than about an hour um, before he started shaking and everything because he couldn't sweat. Quads, a lot of quads don't, you know, aren't able to sweat and everything. He just shake and he just had to, he had to go and get back on the bed, all because of a, yeah, the uh, bravado and, and egged on by his mates to do it, and he did it, and he suffered for it. I don't even know whether he, um, whether he's still alive now, but that was back in 75. Yeah, yeah. Some people, um, do things and you know, I look back on when I was younger wondering why I didn't end up you know, hurting myself badly but it's just the grace of God at the time I suppose. Yes it is but you, you can't change the clock back with some of the issues that's no. the definite to set up. You know, it's, um, that's why a lot of people still think yeah, that it was a car accident or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just a fact. Okay. Um, no. But the lights keep turning off in there. Yeah. Thank you. No, that, that'll probably just do us. Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks for watching that video. Just want everyone to know that I will be putting content up every week. I'm also looking for people to interview. Uh, and if there's any topics you want me to cover, uh, just let me know in the comment section. And please make sure you hit that subscribe, like and share buttons. Thank you.